this um, question of the telos in nature was, you know, to make friends, lifelong friends into enemies and sunder families. Alfred Russell Wallace, who was the co-discoverer of evolution with Darwin, really preceded him. He, he uh, had a fever. He was a professional butterfly collector, as I was once in my youth. And on the island of Ternate in eastern Indonesia, Wallace fell into a malarial fever. And at the height of this fever, he wrote down a page and a half of scribbling, which when he came down from this illness and read it, it seemed to hold up. And what he had discovered was what all biology was seeking, what he called the solution to the problem of the species. And he looked at this thing, and what it was, was a description of natural selection. And it seemed to work. Well, Wallace was uh, from the lower classes, had made his living in England as a surveyor, was a, a, essentially a field biologist because he was not accepted by the gentleman scientists of England. He didn't know where to turn, so he fired off a letter to the only person he could think of to ask, who was the greatest biologist of the day, Charles Darwin, at home in England in his garden, working over 20 years of notes on the problem of the species. When Darwin got this letter from this unknown character, postmarked Ambon, Dutch East Indies, and read it, he paled visibly. Uh, <laughs> And he went to his friend, Sir Charles Lyell, who was the, great, the greatest geologist of the day, the proponent of catastrophism, and one of the great, was to develop into one of the great defenders of Darwin's theory. He went to Charles Lyell and said, uh, I've been working 20 years on this idea. This came in the post. This, this is it. It's all here. And Lyle said, don't worry, my friend, we will schedule two papers to be delivered at the Royal Society. They will be delivered on the same evening, and yours shall be first. And so it was. And so it comes down to us as Darwin's theory of evolution. But in fact, in a way, for philosophical purists, it may have been better that way. Because Wallace, who was uh, in many ways a deeper thinker than Darwin, uh, was a, a Fabian socialist, was fascinated by paranormal phenomena, uh, as well as being interested in electricity, biogeography, uh, anthropology, uh, truly one of the last of the great polymaths. Wallace was unable to take the final step on the question of teleology. And he said, I cannot believe that random processes ameliorated by natural selection can give rise to a creature such as man. So this was the break in the 19th century. And it, uh, it arises out of the earlier foundation of the struggle between intuition and reason. I mean, I think our intuition must place us in Wallace's camp, that there is a telos of some sort. There is an omega point toward which all creation, however unsteadily, moves. And it is because of this uh, Omega point that we do live in a cosmos and not a chaos, not simply a raging confusion, but something that is structured and ordered. Well, in spite of the fact that evolution was seeking to serve the most rigorous scientific desires to exclude teleology and to exclude God from the process of the natural world, uh, it introduced a bizarre concept which cut against its own purposes. 
the concept is a kind of progress in nature where previously none had been so that uh, from Aristotle to the 19th century what you have as a theory of nature is what's called the great chain of being or the great ladder of being and it stretches from God through the archangels the cherubim, the cherubim, down man, then the animal kingdom, the vegetable kingdom, so forth and so on. But it is imagined as static, as put in place by the fiat looks of creation, set in place for all time. What, what uh, Darwin did was to see it as not a great chain of being, but as an escalator of being. He added the notion of progressive movement toward higher and higher forms, more and more complex manifestations of the uh, intrinsic ingression of novelty into actual events. And this idea is very, very interesting and cogent and pregnant with possibility for all of us and our world. You see, what it is really is it's a recasting of an idea that had been banished for several centuries from Western thinking. It is the alchemical idea that nature is driving to perfect itself. This was what the alchemists believed. They believed that through time, uh, lesser metals became gold and that what the alchemist was trying to do was to compress time. He was trying to, f to catalyze a natural process so that what took thousands in their imagination of years in the body of the earth could be compressed into days or weeks in the alembic of the alchemist. Well, as science defined itself in the, throughout the 17th and 18th century under the impetus of Descartes and, uh, and uh, Kant and all of these people, uh, this notion of uh, the world as a distillate apparatus was given up. But it returns in the idea of evolution and uh, we inherit it in the social world, now this is a delicate point, there is something called social Darwinism, otherwise known as fascism. Social Darwinism uses a very vulgar understanding of evolutionary dynamics to justify class oppression by saying that uh, it must be right that some people have their foot on other people's necks, because isn't this what nature is about? Struggle of the fittest and survival of the, the longest fang, the swiftest claw, the sharpest tooth? Well, the answer is no, absolutely not. This, this rests on an understanding of nature that was in vogue 150 years ago, that is not in vogue now. That's what you see. When you look at nature at the, at the, in the human dimension, but when you analyze nature as uh, an integrated system of chemical reactions, gene transfer, cat catalytic self-regulating activities, hypercycles of energy, nutrients, and metabolism, when you analyze nature from that point of view, you see that it seeks to maximize cooperation, connectedness, mutual interdependability is the thing which holds the whole thing together. And the species that is most successful is not the species that can dominate all others, it's the species that can make itself indispensable to all others.